Today's message from Rev. Christian Sorensen was recorded February 28, 2016, titled Good to Great. It's subtitled Stretch and Growing Beyond Where We Are to Where We're Going. Come visit us sometime at www.seasidecenter.org or join us in Encinitas, California sometime, where great music, a spirited message, and a joyful, loving community always await you. Feel the joy, feel the peace, and the comfort of home, cause all the welcome here is yes, all. This morning, uh, the message is good to great. And uh, to get from good to great, we got to stretch. Now, as you know, I'm not really big for struggle for struggle's sake. I, I'm not a big believer like struggling is a really fun kind of thing. But also what I've come to recognize is it is necessary for us to stretch and grow beyond where we are to where we're going by entering into that space that requires us, I don't know, struggle, but to stretch or to grow or to expand and to be able to recognize that it is that internal movement that allows us to figure out the scope and the stretch of our wingspan. You know, it is that breath of, um, of the fight that allows us to figure out the flight in which we are able to make in our world. I know when I was learning how to fly, I it was a year's worth of stretching and challenges of the brain and the comfort zone and all that. But as only as I was able to meet that, was I able to push beyond the level where I was that I was able to finally take off and fly. And so what I want us to get is there is something inside of you that is so great and so wonderful. And as you begin to push and you hit that level of stretch from, you know, it's good. My world's okay. It's good. But to move into great and it's not moving and it's not happening. And there is that struggle or there is that dynamic. I don't care what you call it, but what I've recognized over and over, I have to push through where I was in order to move to a place that is greater. I am encouraging you to stay there, to stick with it, to keep going and keep practicing that because the truth of who you are wants to come out into this world. And even if you find, yes, it's, uh, even if you find yourself, um, I don't know, in a dull job with a boss yelling at you, uh, you're still an Academy Award winner. You know, you, you are still uh, that CEO of that, I don't know, nutritional corporation that you're working on or uh, that beloved in a divine partnership because the truth of who you are, the circumstances may not be matching that right now, but the truth of who you are is shouting. It is screaming and it is jumping up down and with joy. It is the thunder in your heart that says, yes, this is who I am in this world. And it's up to you to realize this is who I am. And I'm going to move from good and okay to great. And I may have to struggle. I may have to push through my comfort zone. I may have to go to an edge I haven't been yet. But you know what? It is a lot better than not being who I'm intended to be. And so I am here today to encourage you to move from a place of good to that Academy Award winner, to that place of great. A drop in your new CD like Carl is doing today of delivering that something that is stirring in your soul. And there is a, there's a saying in the business world that says good is the enemy of great. You know, it's like, you know, just being okay. And this is what's working. Okay, there's a little profit, life. So. But that's not who you're intended to be. You're intended to be a deliverer of the divine message and divine expression in your life and your world. And greatness doesn't just show up as a coincidence in our life. It shows up as a conscious choice. I'm consciously going to move through this membrane of, uh, of whatever is holding me back to experiencing something greater. And when I come to the edge in my world, it is a message to me to see where it is I need to work to stretch to keep going. That's why I said, stay with it. Go with it. Say, what do I need to know here? What's going on here? I can remember one time walking with Trevor. Actually, it's happened often, but the one I'm thinking about was on the beach, and there was this golden retriever that came running up to us. Now, we both instantly recognized, here comes a dog. But we had divergent responses. Personally, 
I used to have a golden retriever, and I love golden retrievers. I love those floppy, sloppy dogs that just want to be loved and share love, and I'm down on my knee, ex- uh, ready to catch this expression of unbounded joy. Trevor, on the other hand, is terrified of dogs, you know, or actually any animal for that matter, because he likes things in a very controlled environment, and dogs are expressive beyond any kind of control we can put upon them. And they're going to be barking or jumping or doing something. He doesn't know what's coming, and he's sitting there on the edge of discomfort. Now, here are two entirely different responses to one experience that, that is going on in, uh, in our dynamics and in our experience in, in our life. And that is the thing that is valuable for us to get is that we get to choose how we're going to respond to what is going on in our life. So if I am pushing that membrane, if I am moving into that internal place where there's some struggle going on or some stretching, where I'm about to find a greater sense of freedom and greater sense of possibilities, I need to be willing to, in the moment, have a higher perspective or a mountaintop perspective and and observe, you know what, there's some discomfort coming up here, and there is something greater inside of me. There is this purpose, my true nature, something wants to move forward in life, and I need to take care of myself here in this moment and begin to realize I am not a victim or a responder to my subjective patterns that have been put in place. And what comes at us in life shows us what's in the labyrinth of our subjective. And this, this, this collective consciousness, you know, that's what Ernest Holmes used to call it. He called it collect, our individual subjective or collective consciousness. There is the race consciousness, as Ernest called it. Carl Jung and Freud talked about the collective unconscious. Um, you, know, but you go back thousands of years, a couple thousand years, the Buddhists talked about you have the individual subconscious or collective consciousness, and then you got the storehouse consciousness of what they talked about, what Ernest called the race consciousness. And we are at the effect of both of those going on in our world. And so what am I going to do with that? Am I going to just continue to respond without checking in and seeing if I want to respond differently? See, if I want to move from good and it's okay to great, dynamic, deliverer of the divine message or expression in my world, I've got to be willing to take a look at that without attachment, but with an openness and realize that, you know what, this concept of something below the surface is not just for Jung or Freud or Buddhists or Ernest, but the scientists. You had David Bohm talking about the holographic universe, where the holograph of peace contains the whole you got science talking about the fractal universe where there is in the little fractal piece is the whole possibility. And in that whole possibility, you got the shadow or the difficulties, but you also got the magnificence, the possibility of greatness. And I am the one who has to decide to move beyond this internal struggle to be able to experience something greater in my life. There was um, an old a master teacher who I guess he worked for the emperor of China because the story goes that he wanted to teach him about the many and the one. And so he built a 12-sided pavilion with mirrors from floor to ceiling. And he brought the emperor of China into this pavilion and he hung a candle in the center of this pavilion. And all of a sudden it reflected hundreds if not thousands of candles all around the master said, this is an example of the one in the many. And then from there, he took a crystal and he hung it below the candle and had the emperor come up and take a look at this on the little teeny um, sides uh, uh, of that crystal. He could see the many different candles. And he said, here's an example of the many in the one. So I want us to understand that you can go either way with this, depending on how you're looking at stepping out into the world, how you're looking at stepping out into life. Am I going to be an expression of the one or an expression of the many? But the choice comes down to my expression here. I get to be that place where spirit manifests. And what am I going to do with that? Am I going to embrace what the world is trying to tell me or am I going to resist it and not move into greatness? So I'm reading um, this book, an old business book that you may be familiar with, and it's called Good to Great. That's where I actually got the title from. You know, I, at my book title today was a little long, so I just cut down to Good to Great, and I looked at the book, and uh, Jim Collins, just a, a master in the business realm, 
talks about good to great and how good companies have turned into great companies and how great companies have also gone the other way. And the example, one of the examples he used was a, uh, a company called the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. And it was, um, it was, it was grocery stores in a sense. And it was the leading um, uh, merchant really of the world of that time and one of the top corporations on annual revenue in the United States into the 50s. It was actually number two behind General Motors. And it just dominated the grocery store business. And then there was another company called Kroger. And it was... Um, you know, it was nothing you know, spectacular about it. You know, it held a piece of the market, but it was nothing uh, you know, wonderful about it. And it was interesting. The first half of our, in the 20th century, you know, we, we had two world wars. We had a depression. And so uh, grocery stores were nothing spectacular. Unitarian in its expression, you know, it had everything, had plenty of everything, but people were frugal, they were more careful, it was kind of drab, they had the stuff, this is where they went to get their, their, their food, the grocery stores. But something happened in the second half of the 20th century. After the wars, people in America became a little bit more prosperous minded, and they wanted a little bit more from their grocery stores. They wanted a little bit more opportunities and choices They wanted to be able to buy fresh, good-looking produce. They wanted to be able to have five choices of sprouts if they wanted. They wanted to be able to buy their holistic products there if they wanted. They wanted to have, you know, 10 choices of milk, non-fat, low-fat, no-fat, you know, almond, soy, uh, rice, and and coconut milk, you know, and, you know, a half a dozen cereals weren't okay. We wanted, you know, 10 dozen choices of cereals to line it and make it a little more convenient. You know, please have my flowers there so I can pick it up and the deli as well and in a bakery so I can have my fresh bread and let's throw in a bank while we're at it. (laughs) Personally, I'd like to have the laundry mat there too. So, well, what, what happened is as things began to change in the dynamics, both Kroger and uh, A&P, you know, they, you know they, they began to lose a piece of the market share with this change going on. You may think, well, it's just a couple old companies. You know, A&P had been around over 100 years and Kroger had been 80 years. And, but what they did is they went and they researched the market and A&P set up a, another grocery store that was totally independent of them, didn't have their products. They let the managers be creative and they found out what the people wanted. It was called Golden Key Groceries and it did very well. But what's interesting here is A&P didn't like what they were hearing coming back, so they closed them down. And they went and began to tank where Kroger, they got the information and they made a determination in 1969 that, you know what, we need to turn into one of these super grocery stores. And they spent the next 25 years working on that. And it was 1999, they became the number one uh, grocery store in America because they were able to look and see what was going on and then take in that information and to move from good to great in our life, to move from good to great in a corporation, to move from good to great in your business or in your world of affairs or your relationship, you have got to be willing. What the great corporations do is ask questions. You want to take that Socratic approach and say, hey, let me hear what's going on here. Not the manipulative one, like the manager's going, you do agree with me, don't you? (laughs) That's not the question. It's like, or how did you mess up? That's not a really opening, open-ended question. It is like, what's going on? What are your thoughts? What do I need to understand? What kind of information do you want to bring? How are things changing? How is it that we can incorporate it? And as we begin to open up, and if there's a mistake or a failure, you do an autopsy without blame. <laughs> you say, hey, what happened here? Sometimes things die. What do I need to know? Not blame, not attack. This is how you move from good to great. This is how you become a receptive place for new information and new insights so you can begin to move to that new level of of understanding. Because that's what you want to, I don't know if that's what you want. I want to do, at least for Seaside, I want to move from here, boom, to what's next for, for Seaside. There was this philosopher out of England by the name of Isaiah Berlin. And he wrote an essay about the hedgehog and the fox, which was really a parable from Greece. It's a Grecian parable about um, a fox, smart, 
beautiful, swift on its feet, very cunning, calculating, swift, smart, and a hedgehog. Um, really looks like a, a genetic mistake, uh, you know, <laughs> between a porcupine and a small uh, armadillo. You know? And so this fox, you know, wants to eat the hedgehog, you know. And so it, it comes up and it schemes, you know, it calculates. It comes up with all these different plans on how to eat it. And the hedgehog, um, he just goes walking out, he kind of dawdles, and all he cares about is one thing. You know, all he cares about is his lunch <laughs> and going home and taking care of things at home. That's all he cares about is the one thing. And so he's out on the road and he gets right to the turn and here's the fox. He's been calculating, he's ready to pounce on him. And the hedgehog goes, oh no, not again today. It rolls up in the ball and the fox like backs off because here are all these porcupine quills sharp ready to get him. And uh, you know, the fox runs off and starts calculating again, how am I going to get him again tomorrow? You know? And so the example of the hedgehog is there's just one thing where the fox has many different things. It calculates, it schemes, it strategizes, and it comes up with all these different methods and ideas, and the hedgehog only has one thing. I mean, I grew up with the cartoon of the Roadrunner. Remember that? Wiley Coyote who would spend all day scheming on how to get the Roadrunner, and the Roadrunner, one thing, fast, beep, out of here. And the successful businesses repeatedly show us that they do one thing. And they do that one thing better than anybody else. And they work on that and they develop that and they strategize over that. And it has to meet what is the one thing. If there's an idea here, does it support the one thing we do? Whether it's Apple. I mean, GE just this last year sold off their financing department because they realized that's not their one thing to do. It was no longer, they could no longer be the best at it, and that's it. They wanted to be the best at the one thing that they do. You know, Seaside's one thing, you hear our, our vision time and time again, we are a spiritual nexus. That's a center. We are a spiritual center. We are a spiritual nexus inspiring you, inspiring me, inspiring us to live our divinity. We are here to live our divinity, our divine expression, to live our dream. That's our one thing. And when we make decisions on our goals, and it, does it support this vision? When we make our decision on our missions or what it is we're bringing, does it support the one thing? You want to move from good to great in your world? You get clear on that one thing and be willing to do that internal fight or that battle so you can recognize the scope of your wings. So when you come up against the challenges in your life, you are able to face that. And to deal with that, because you're going to be tempted to do this other thing. You know, it's like a big, bright sparkle. You know what? I'm going to want to um, do this project. And I want to do this project, this project, this project, and this one over here. All in the same 24 hours I used to do the one project in. You know, this multitasking isn't really big for that one thing. You know, what I do has to support this one thing. There's only so much energy to go around, but I get tempted. And a lot of times those temptations will pull us in directions that do not support that soul of yours that is jumping up and down in joy and the heart that is thundering because it has something to do in this world. It has something. We've got to take care of ourselves. that self-care. Is not selfish. Parker Palmer says this. Self-care is not selfish. You know, you've been given this body, so you, or you've been given this, I say the body, but you've been given this in order to bring to this world that which you have to do. Great educator. You know, self-care is not selfish. You know, it's yours to take care of this. You know, and so you can get tempted. Hey, this looks intriguing. This looks like a possibility. But also you get tempted by the fears. You get tempted by uh, things that could pull you down. You get tempted to believe in headlines. And the thing about temptations is the power doesn't lie in the temptation. The power lies in your response to the temptations. Because this world is continuously going to offer you, try this, try this little boy, <laughs> you know, try this. And so what you want to do is to know that one thing. If you want to move from good to great, if you want to be the greatest at being who you are, then you've got to know what it is yours to do. You know, mine has always been to assist people to hear their inner voice and to be led by that. 
Not by me, not by anything else, but your own inner voice. It works perfectly with Seaside's you know, vision. is to be that spiritual nexus inspiring you to live your divinity. It, it, it's a match, and it, it works there. And so as you begin to not buy into the temptation because you're familiar with what that is that resonates with your soul, you become more familiar with what that click feels like. You know, I do prayers. You know, I pray until... There's something that happens. You have developed this, I don't know, this inner ear or this, this inner hearing. And I like to say, I know it's good because I get these grand visions. Ah, it's all wonderful. But it's more of a sense of a, a breath, a sigh, like, ah, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's good. You know, it's, it's almost like this warm sense that just comes over my being, a warm water that just washes over to the prayer. And it's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is it. And the healing happens. The transformation happens. It doesn't matter what it is. All, what it is, that's what's irrelevant. You know, yes, there is error in this world. Goldsmith talks about a lot about the nature of error. And people say, Goldsmith, I thought you're this absolute. It's all an illusion. He says, well, I'll tell you what. You know, there's things in this world. And the new thoughters, I'm adding that, just say, hey, it, it's not so. Well, if you're using your energy to say it's not there, it's not there, and it's bugging you, It's there. (laughs) And what he talks about, Goldsmith says, you look at the nature of error and you see that there's really nothing there. But you've got to look at it. Because as long as you pretend it's not there, it's going to bug you that it's there. But when you're willing to look at it and realize there is no power there in that, then all of a sudden, this invisible membrane that I can't pass through and what looks like uh, struggle is really that which is growing me, stretching me, evolving me, and assisting me to step into a greater expression of who I am. Another classic story from Good to Great is um, it it comes from the 60s when uh, Scott Paper dominated the paper consumer good market. They were the undisputed king, queen of that market until Procter & Gamble decided they were going to come in and take over that market share. And so Procter & Gamble got their team together and they went in and they just dominated. So in 1971, Scott Paper's CEO got together his team and they said it was just a very sad meeting that he like threw in the towel, probably paper towel. (laughs) And, um, he said, you know what, guys? We'll just be satisfied with taking the number two spot. We'll just protect our, our market share. That's good, what it is we do. And hopefully in the B player, uh, the, the big uh, monster that entered this market will leave us alone. That's one approach. That's Trevor's approach. Oh, no, dog. It's what's going on in your subjective or the collective subjective. But there was another player, small player. It's called Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark responded in a different way. The CEO got together the managers and the the team of people and said, this is an exciting day. Goliath has entered into this market. What better and stronger adversary could we have than uh, Procter & Gamble to sharpen our skills to become stronger and better in what it is that we do? What's the one thing we are about paper good delivering that to the consumer. So they sold off their paper mill plants and focused solely on that. And they said it is a great adversary. And it's not because of disrespect. They said they are big, they are large, they are excellent in their marketing. They have got great managers and good products. But you know what? We are going to step in and take on Goliath head on. And that is exactly what they did. The manager said, I want all of you, not you guys, but he said to the team, I want all of you to stand up and bow your heads and we're going to take a moment of silence here. People are wondering, who died? <laughs> the manager said, okay, raise your heads. That's for Procter and Gamble, because they have just died. <laughs> we are the ones that are stepping up. And every other paper company fell to them except one, which was Kimberly Clark, who took it on. You know, Leslie was sharing with me in the Rose Room before we came out. It's like that story of Joshua and Caleb going into the promised land. And everybody came back and said that, uh, you know, it's a land of giants. We can't go in there. But Caleb and Joshua said, you know what? 
Yeah, but it's a land of milk and honey. There's a land of opportunities. And what you have got to do is be willing to stretch internally and figure out how much you can spread your wings. And what comes up for you is coming from your subjective to take a look at because you and God are a majority. You and God have the ability to move from what is good and what is working to what is great and what this world hungers for. Because what this world hungers for is for you to be great in your world, to deliver that for which you have come here. Your self-care has given you the strength so you can deliver it in a way. And granted, it might take a while. It took Kroger Kroger, 25 years to recognize the information that was given to them and to change 100% of their stores from the Depression War era to the superstores that we hunger for. 25 years for them to become number one in their market, to become the greatest in their industry. It's like a flywheel. Are you familiar with a flywheel? It's this big round wheel that you got to get moving. Now imagine we've got a 30-foot round flywheel here on the stage. It's upright, so it's on an axis. Okay, It's two feet wide, made of cement, and literally weighs tons. I say, okay, start spinning that. Yeah, I don't blame you. I would too. I'd laugh. You know, and all you push, and you know, it hardly even moves, hardly even noticeable, but you keep going. And maybe in two or three hours, you're able to get one full turn of that flywheel going. But all of a sudden, you keep pushing, and it moves a little bit faster because it's starting to pick up some momentum. And in the next hour, you're able to do another one. And then all of a sudden, two, and then three, and then four, and then 10, and then 100, and then 1,000, and then 10,000, because all of a sudden, you have got the rotation, you have got the gravity, you have got the momentum going in this flywheel that is going faster and faster and faster that sends rockets into space. That is what we have to do sometimes when we come up against that struggle and say, oh no, I don't know if I can do this. It looks big. Well, so did Procter and Gamble. So did Goliath. But the vision, the one thing I do that I've been called into this world to do, I'm capable of. And I'm going to stick with it. And I'm going to go with that. I know I can. You know, I grew up in Hollywood. So the college basketball team I grew up with was the UCLA Bruins. And it was a college team that dominated the basketball tournaments through the 60s and the early part of the 70s. If you know the story of John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, he won 10 national championships in 12 years. That's what I grew up with. That's what I thought basketball was, that UCLA won every year. One time, they went 61 games, two seasons without ever losing a game. They were giants in this. And that's what I assumed was college basketball. UCLA was always at the top. So only years later did I learn that John Wooden started in 1948. And it took him 15 years before he won the first national championship in 1964. But all I was aware of was this huge success. And what happens a lot of times in life, we miss that part of getting that people who are spending time getting that flywheel working of the struggles that they are moving through to hone their skills, to strengthen their courage, to discover a freedom in the midst of question and challenge that is going on. They're willing to face the errors, the demons of their subjective as it comes up and realize that, you know what, I need a greater view than this situation that is going on, that there is something that is greater here, and it may be a long road, but there's a Turkish proverb that, that says... Um, No road is long with good friends. No road is long with good friends. I got to tell you, for 25 years, we've been doing, I've been doing the seaside thing with all of you, and every day has been a joy. It doesn't ever seem to be long. It has been exciting, it has been dynamic, and it is fun. And all of a sudden, we've got a full house and a crew sitting in the back, you know, and it didn't like just happen. It has been over a period of time, but loving and the joy of it all, of being true to the one thing, being that spiritual center, that spiritual nexus that inspires people to live their divinity, their God connection. 
And it's been the one thing that Seaside has been committed to doing over and over and over. And all of a sudden, we look up and the place is full. It's like an egg. All of a sudden, it cracks and out comes a chicken. And if there were reporters, say, wow, isn't this an amazing transformation in life from an egg, a chicken? Well, look at what has happened. Now they, they've got this life, this newness. But from the chicken's point of view, it's been a long haul in there developing, coming aware and all, all that. Yeah. So what is your one thing? If you want to move from good to great, it's important for you to figure out your one thing. Not being like that sly fox that has all these strategies to do all these different things. Or like the hedgehog. What is the one thing that's yours to do? Martin Luther King, in honor of Black History Month, or the season for nonviolence, he said, peace is not merely the goal that we seek. It's the means by which we seek the goal. See? Now, the goal is not it. It's who you are. It's how you do it. It is uh, the breath of the, the, the wingspan of the flight that the fight got you ready for. Um, Bette Midler said, cherish forever your uniqueness because you're just a yawn if it goes. <laughs> Cherish your uniqueness because you're just a yawn. You're a bore if it goes. See, cherish your one thing. Cherish who you are. Your divine expression. It's up to you to take care of who you are. That is the self-care. And when things come up from your subjective, look at them. Don't run from them. Don't pretend they're not there. Find the courage and the faith to look at that and realize, you know what? I'm going to get down and just greet that floppy, sloppy expression of life that's running at me. I'm not going to run from it. But you know what? It may take some time to gain that kind of courage in my life to move from, hey, I'm comfortable in my little bubble. I'm safe. No dogs. Nobody's bothering me. But you know what? I'm intended to be more than that in this world. And I'm going to start that flywheel going. It may take a while. It may take 25 years like Kroger Grocery to become number one. But you know what? That is my one thing. And I'm not going to be tempted by the sparkle or the fluff or the fear or the errors of this world. I'm going to listen to that inner voice and be guided by that as I move forward in this life and do what I do as Christina Tillotson did for 20 years before she ever got recognized that she was transforming the world through the internet and reaching thousands of people that we didn't even know were out there. You know, that's Tim standing behind that camera for over a decade, shining this podcast and live streaming to the world. We don't know who we're touching, but we know you're there and we love you. Where in your life are you committed to doing that one thing you came into this world? And my challenge to you then is to do it. God bless you as you do. I love you. Oh, man. Such a long way.
brought you to this place He cried for mercy And you longed for grace Feel the love, feel the light Won't you come in from the cold Cause all the welcome here Feel the joy Welcome Here, from the album Path of Light, was co-written by Peggy Lebo and Rev. Christian Sorensen. It's available at www.peggylebo.com.